Hello, everybody. My name is John Doggett, and I'm uh, delighted to be here again with uh, a dear colleague of mine, uh, Admiral Bob Inman. We have a lot to cover. We were told that we need to talk about the status of the world in the next 30 minutes, and so we're going to try to do that. So, Bob, good to see you again. Good to see you, John. So here's my first question. Biden has been president for 64 days. What grade do you give his administration? B plus. Tell me why. Um, the $1.9 trillion had a lot in it that wasn't COVID-19 related. Oh, yeah. Uh, sort of it's reminiscent of the 2008-2009 stimulus as well. Um, and um, they clearly, they move swiftly with a number of executive orders to change policies from the Trump uh, era. But they did not always anticipate what the outcome might be. And we're seeing that in the flood of people trying to come across the border in the South who believe that the limits are now off and it's a good time to go to the U.S. President now Biden, as candidate, encouraged the immigrants to surge toward the border because there's going to be a new policy. What should the Biden administration do right now, given that we're looking at 20 year uh, levels of record levels of uh, illegal immigration. Well, they've sent representatives to both Mexico City and to Guatemala, apparently, to convey the message. But there needs to be a loud public message saying, stay at home. Uh, now is not the time to get yourself in the clutches of the people who are taking money to smuggle you north. Mm -hmm. Is it important that President Biden or Vice President Harris go to the border now, given what's going on? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I've watched the media push, when are you going to the border? That just distracts the people who are on the border trying to solve the problem. And if they have to divert to provide security for the president, the vice president, that's not helpful in getting on with solving what is clearly a very pressing problem of the unaccompanied kids. Okay. Here's one issue that also is very interesting. Uh, the Secretary of State of the United States was in Alaska with his counterpart from China. They didn't agree on anything. And in fact, uh, Secretary of State was dressed down by his counterpart, talking about how Chinese communist democracy is better than American democracy. What's your take on that uh, interaction in Alaska? Well, John, the public statements and beckoning the cameras to stay was for domestic audiences, both from the Chinese side and from the US side. Once okay. they got rid of the cameras and got down, I'm told that there was some pretty substantive conversations, uh, both in being very explicit about where we disagree and also about laying out areas where we might be able to come to some agreement on North Korea, on Iran, um, on climate change, uh, the rest of it. But it's very clear that there are very large issues, human rights from the US point of view, interfering in the domestic affairs of China uh, from their point of view. My number one concern right now is to avoid missteps where Taiwan is concerned. Yep. Uh, and, and the biggest misstep would be for Taiwan to declare independence in the process. So status quo is preferable, not easy to maintain. Secretary of Defense Austin went to Tokyo to talk with his counterpart. Uh, and my understanding is both Japan and the United States have reiterated their support for free and independent uh, Taiwan. What do you think happens if uh, China decides to, to test this alliance? Japan has been pressing for a year for wanting to get into detailed classified conversations with the US on jointly agreeing how to react if there was a hostile move toward Taiwan. And apparently General uh, Secretary Austin did agree that those conversations would go forward. So that's very reassuring inside Japan. He went on to Korea to India to Afghanistan. 
So he's tackling some of the biggest problems he's got right up front. You know, if we think about Taiwan, which I want to focus on that just for another minute or so. If there is a move by China towards Taiwan, really Japan is the only country that's close enough to be able to do anything quickly. We cannot, we're too far away. But does Japan have, uh, does their national defense force have the capacity uh, to be a bulwark against uh, communist China? It's Japan's, it's our bases in Japan that are the absolute key okay. to response. Uh, Okinawa, Honshu, uh, we've got a lot of aviation forces, Navy forces, Marines there. And they're the ones that are closest to the scene. But if there is an attack, which I hope won't occur, but if there is, it's gonna have to escalate pretty quickly uh, to the supporting logistics of China uh, to carry out an amphibious attack. If they were to go purely for missile attacks, they would destroy much of what they would hope to be gaining by annexing Taiwan. Yeah. We are seeing a growing awareness of the importance of protecting our strategic assets. Uh, the pandemic probably was the biggest wake up call for a lot of Americans when we realized that our PPE, our, our pharmaceutical products, the whole list of things that are absolutely crucial to our economy are not made in the United States anymore. Do you see this momentum continuing when we get to the end of the summer and anybody who wants to get vaccinated has been vaccinated and the pandemic has come to an end? John, for 40 years or longer, we were focused on just in time uh, to improve the productivity the, and the products available to our consumers and globally. And that meant supply chains uh, that facilitated that process. But we kept a clear focus throughout all that time on national security needs. And therefore, we provided limits, protections to ensure that the critical supply chains uh, for national security were maintained in the US or in the US allies. Uh, that played a role back in the early 80s in semiconductor in the process, both in MCC coming into business to compete with Japanese fifth generation effort, but also with Semitech being yep. created. But we never paid attention to other areas. And what COVID-19 has painfully brought home is that where healthcare is concerned, we need to have maybe not as systematic concern as we have on national security, but we need to make sure we are not constrained by our reliance on foreign manufacture for what ought to be in the US stockpile. Uh, and it's not just uh, supplies PPE at all. Some of it's elevating domestic preparation production for things like testing for uh, viruses. There are gonna be more of them. And to me, of all of the disappointments uh, that surfaced with COVID-19, for me, the greatest one was how totally ill-prepared we were to test for a pandemic. You know, it's really, What's fascinating about this in a very unfortunate way was that Johns Hopkins University had done a, a war game scenario about a global pandemic that finished in November of 2019. And it was prescient, if, you know, it was on the, the web, you could find it on YouTube and watching it as the pandemic started to roll out, it's like, how could we have missed it? Are we going to continue to be a country that plans but doesn't take planning seriously and only reacts when we get kicked in the, in the teeth? It, we get exercised when there's a crisis or a, a war and we put in place a lot of things. And when there's not a repetition, uh, we, we drop it. We shift funding to other things we're, other needs, other things we're interested in. Uh, just as Vietnam hangs over uh, President Lyndon Johnson's legacy. The war in Iraq hangs over George W. Bush's tenure. But 
buried under that is the terrific work done against AIDS in Africa, PEPFAR, which fundamentally changed African attitudes toward the US and a great many countries. But also after SARS uh, in 2003, he built up the, the uh, stockpile to deal with a comparable thing. It was not sustained in the Obama years. No new crisis had arisen and budget priorities shifted. How can we change that attitude? Because what I'm seeing is the gap between the United States and our major competitors is getting smaller and their operation tempo is picking up. If you look at what the Chinese are doing in space, the, the lunar rover that's on the backside of the moon, something we've never done. We're not in a situation where moving slowly and getting our act together in the crisis is a sustainable strategy. Do you see that changing though? Well, that, there are many components of that. One is the fact that Congress is not working effectively to solve problems. And we can go into a long dialogue on that. But the, the reality, uh, as we look at all of this, is short-term memories. Uh, Putin's been in office uh, since 2000. Uh, she's been in office since 2012. But both of them are there as far out as you can see into the future, at least as long as they want to stay. So they can do long range planning of where they want to go and what they want to accomplish. And we are at best limited to four year segments. And the reality is the first year we're getting organized, then you got the midterm elections, right? and then you got the next campaign. So those all help drive short term approaches to dealing with long-term serious problems. It sounds like a business model that is not going to be sustainable in terms of keeping us as a leading uh, economy and political power in this country, in the world. Yeah, I, I don't want to the proverbial throw out the baby with the bath, uh, the bath water. I don't want to diminish democracy as it functions, but we do need to seriously address how we can get more productivity out of Congress, and they play the stronger role that the founders intended them to play in the process, and continuity from the executive branch that you don't have immediately as soon as the other party takes over, the first action is to change as much as you can of what the predecessor had done. And you go back and look at it, both parties are guilty of that. What do you think about the growing use of executive uh, orders uh, that started, that, ex that it was expanded under President Obama, continued under President Trump, and then has been uh, really kind of turbocharged under President Biden? Is it a good or bad thing? This give the bill- it, It's basically a bad thing, John. Okay. And it's a reflection of the fact that, that they can't get Congress to enact what they would like to see as legislation so they go to executive orders, often without even trying in the process. Uh, and that executive orders can play an effective role. I've you know, watched it for a long period of time, uh, interacting directly. Sometime, uh, President Ford did executive order 11905, uh, giving specific duties to intelligence community to try to avoid legislation that he thought would limit in the process. And there are other cases like that where executive orders have been useful and effective, but I'm afraid they're over usage to try to avoid having to bargain with Congress uh, has helped put us in the mess we're in. Speaking about intelligence, there's been a lot of conversations about the SolarWinds Act and then more recently, the revelation by Microsoft that there was a vulnerability in exchange server software that's resulted in uh, both ransomware criminals and hackers going after exchange. Do, is this something that's being overblown by the press because they, they want to sell newspapers? Or is this a serious vulnerability of the United States? Serious vulnerabilities. And we need to understand the components of it. Um, the most sophisticated 
cyber capabilities, setting aside perhaps our own, are the Russians. The largest are the Chinese. The North Koreans, the Iranians are both very active. They've learned what they can do to impact from it. But we tend to sort of blur the distinctions. In 2016, two Russian military organizations, GRU, and one private, one probably mafia licensed to the other intelligence agents, deliberately hacked into Democratic and Republican voting uh, capabilities organizations at the national level and at in a great many states as well. Um, they only released information from the Democratic National Committee. Um, at the time they started all that, Trump wasn't even a candidate. So I don't buy that it was all driven by trying to get Trump elected. I think it was driven by trying to punish Secretary Clinton, whom they blamed for the demonstrations in Moscow after the Duma elections in 2011, but more importantly, Putin's re-election in 2012. But in any case, um, they also were very active on social media, uh, impacting demeaning confidence in democracy. Uh, Ferguson, Charlottesville, other occasions where they would try to get people from both extremes out to fight in the streets. Fast forward to 2020, there was an intense focus on those same Russian organizations. Were they gonna interfere in the 2020 election? Were they gonna potentially try to change votes, whatever? That focus gave the confidence of saying, hey, the election went down fairly. The machines worked, everything else, there was no penetration. They didn't need to. Trump had already been saying in diminishing democracy that if he didn't win, it was because the election was rigged in the process. But what did they do instead? Knowing the US was totally occupied in looking for in interference in the election, they staged the largest uh, espionage effort in my memory of watching uh, through uh, the private sector into the public sector entity as well as private. And we don't know what they left behind uh, uh, to be used at a future time in the process. So the, there are many warnings to us here. One of the challenges is that by legislation, NSA cannot collect against US entities inside the US which means they can't track the servers. The Russians recognized that, and in solar winds, they came inside and penetrated US servers. And the group tasked to try to track what's happening in the private sector, Homeland Security, doesn't have the capability. So we ended up only discovering it because of a private enterprise tracking uh, for money-making purposes, fire eye, and they, once they detected it, we took off. But what it tells us is that we have a very significant problem uh, of collecting against foreign activities inside the U.S. that use U.S. servers to conduct those operations. So we need to revisit access. We can put very tight limits on how you use what you collect. But if you can't collect at all, you're gonna miss foreigners using it to do espionage activities. You know, I'm feeling stronger and stronger that our country is becoming so myopic. People are very concerned about uh, privacy and security, which is important. I'm concerned about that, I'm sure you are also. But we're living in a world where I believe the third world war, which is a cyber war has already started. Uh, and if you're going to fight a war, you got to use all the weapons and tools that you have. Do you see it being possible for this administration to convince its supporters that this is a dangerous neighborhood that we live in, as Benjamin Netanyahu used to say, and we need to rethink 
how our democracy works in the face of the threats that we face. Do you think the Biden administration has the capability of, of, of getting this message out to its supporters? Well, the one first good sign I've seen is that they brought a very capable woman from NSA who understands this process. They brought her to the White House to be the czar, uh, something that was recommended to Obama that he didn't do, and Trump wouldn't even consider it in the process. So that's at least a good start for clearly understanding the problem and laying out strategy of how we need to deal with it. And there are deeper ramifications here, John. Um, you can't avoid surprise like the 6th of January if you aren't tracking domestic terrorists. And the place most likely to find that is in social media at all. So FBI uh, apparently has some effort. I don't understand. I don't understand what effort they have in any depth. So I shouldn't critique uh, its validity or how, how effective it is. But we're, we're tiring our hands behind our back in not using the electronic efforts to do it. This is inevitably the issue of public of privacy of each of us as individuals. My reaction is every time we go on the internet, we're being tracked everywhere we go for commercial purposes. If we've already surrendered our personal privacy, what's the problem with the government knowing that information if it might help us be more secure? And I think, Bob, the answer is that there are people who are just, that whole phrase, the government knowing, just scares the bejesus out of it. Uh, but they feel very comfortable with Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos knowing. <laughs> and from where I sit, I don't really understand why you'd feel comfortable with either side. So let's, let's pivot and, and let's talk about Mexico for a second. Right now, Americans, when they think about Mexico, they think about what's happening at the border. But when I look at Mexico, I look at the decision by Canadian Pacific to buy a Kansas City Southern Railroad and create a transcontinental uh, railroad. Uh, is it correct to think that we're going to see a much closer relationship from a business and strategic standpoint between Mexico, the United States, and Canada moving forward? We have conflicting pressures. We see the potential for successful economic access and growth in all three countries by linking the economies much more closely. Our earlier conversation about uh, dependence on just-in-time delivery and the rest of it, um, clearly we ought to be in a situation where made in Mexico, made in Canada is considered totally reliable. But the problem here uh, largely is in Mexico and it's political and criminal in the issue. Lopez Obrador won decisively three years ago after on his fourth try for election for the presidency. And he then managed to sweep in likewise a control of the legislature. And that was largely a result of exposure of corruption in the previous government. But the end result is not promising when it comes, is Mexico better governed now than it was three years ago? Uh, I, I think I'd have to give a D or D plus uh, on the report card on that issue. They, the impact of the cartels on the society writ large continues to be huge. We had a clash just couple of days ago, when there was a very direct attack killing a number of law enforcement and judicial people in an ambush, uh, not all that far south from Brownsville in the process. And it's the kind of ongoing uh, issue that makes me reluctant to further embrace what I see going on in Mexico right now. So I would love to see a well-governed Mexico as an integral economic partner, and one where we had an immigration system we'd be comfortable with, 
where we would use biometric cards, ID cards with uh, iris and thumbprints that would let workers come and go, keep their families in Mexico more affordable, comfortable in their culture, and help take off the pressure for illegal immigration into the US. Achievable technologies there now, but we don't have the willpower on either side of the border to move to interact it. You know, our relationship with Mexico has been dominated by worrying about the cartels and the illegal movement of drugs and the movement of migrants across the border. Could that relationship change if the focus became your economy can grow at a 10 or 15 percent basis per annum if you cooperate with us? Because we desperately need you, Mexico, to become our Taiwan, our China, our India, because you're right. Would that be a way to encourage the Mexican government to get its act together? If we were to publicize a well thought out program of how we would open up for creating jobs in Mexico in the process, provided they dealt with the security concerns. That could go a long way toward generating a change in the Mexican population, pressure on the government to go after the cartels. Uh, Several presidents have just taken bribes. Others have gone after them using the military, but without great success. They are deeply entrenched. They are a huge factor uh, in the country. So it's not an easy problem to go solve. But right now, the incentives aren't there to try to solve it. We could help that if we would offer. These are incentives that we're prepared to offer if you take care of that problem. Thinking about Mexico, the obvious next country of concern is Venezuela. Venezuela has the potential to be a dynamic part of this hemisphere. Right now, it's still spiraling into decay. The only thing that's going good for Venezuela right now is the price of crude oil is going up, and therefore, revenues they get from Citgo, revenues they're getting now from increasing contracts with China, uh, prop up the Maduro regime. Going back to the Monroe Doctrine, is it in our interest to do anything about Venezuela, or should we just sit back and let Xi and Putin continue to deepen their tentacles into Venezuela, which is right in our backyard? It's a failed state, and the population has suffered greatly. We focus on human rights in many other parts of the world, Hmm. but one of the greatest human rights travesties is right in our own hemisphere in Venezuela in the process as Maduro uses a a heavy hand to maintain power. Why does the army let him stay in power? Because the senior leaders are getting paid off regularly for the flow of narcotics from Colombia across Venezuela headed to Europe to supply the narcotic supply there. So why would they give up the lucrative life they have uh, by pushing out Maduro and going to different regimes? So that plays a role as well as the ongoing Chinese and Russian support. There aren't good options available to us right now. So this is gonna take a longer time, but it ultimately is gonna have to come from within Venezuela, frankly, Offering bigger bribes to the military to get rid of, might be a better use of money than other things we could approach. Does it make sense for us to allow CITGO, which is owned 100% by the Venezuelan government effectively, to continue to operate refineries and gas stations in the United States since that money directly supports uh, the most brutal dictatorial regime in this hemisphere? Well, I've been in favor for a long time of seizing the Citgo assets uh, to help compensate for all the other damage being done, sustain the uh, Venezuelans who are in exile. Uh, There are a large number of refugees in Venezuela and uh, Brazil. uh, We're using the US Treasury borrowed money 
to send needed checks out to people in the U.S. Well, how about taking the money from Cisco and flowing some steady income to those refugees who are suffering in uh, Colombia and Brazil? No, you and I agree. That's the kind of Don Quixote act I play too often, which gets me in trouble. <laughs> well, our 30 minutes for uh, just talking and having a conversation have come to an end. So now we're going to go into the questions because we've received an amazing number of questions. My timer will not shut up. Okay, there we go. We've, we've received an amazing number of questions. So the first one is, if we look back at Russia. Yeah, I'm reminded of the debate between Obama and Romney when Romney said, my biggest concern in terms of foreign uh, policy is Russia and Obama laughed at him. How serious should we continue to take Russia besides their hacking? Are they really a threat to us? Or is, it, is the game really a game between the United States and China? I don't know, Russia is still a factor. Um, they, are, they don't have as much potential as uh, China has uh, because China's economy has boomed to be the second largest in the world and still growing. Uh, so they've got the resources. to. What China doesn't yet have is a clear indication of what role they want to play in the world writ large. They clearly play an economic role and their One Belt, One Road uh, massive program on loans, not grants, to guarantee access to raw materials and access to markets. That's a factor that doesn't play in the Russian side at all. But Russia continues to have massive nuclear arms, large armed forces that they are finally modernizing as price of oil resumes. Um, their real challenge is health continues to be a significant problem. Yep. Um, Putin continues to be popular, but his popularity has declined. Uh, there's more sign out across the country. The real issue is where's, where's the new talent coming along? Exactly. There are some indications that Putin ha has reached out to the provinces trying to identify bright, people in their 30s to put in the local governments as looking at where could you get talent to bring to Moscow. He clearly recognizes that the Siloviki, the, the people out of the intelligence organizations that have kept him in power and helped him grow his great personal wealth, they're aging. And so the, the real issue is who's going to replace them? Yeah. And particularly if he's going to continue to keep control, he's going to have to bring fresh talent in. The worry is he will divert internal distress with, out, with external adventures. He's involved in Libya. He's involved in Syria. Um, I continue to worry about the Baltics, where he may go in that process. So yeah. I'm greater, I'm more afraid of Russia from the point of using force to go take over other countries than I'm about China with the exception of Taiwan. If we think about the Middle East, there was this conflict that blew up. Most Americans didn't pay attention to it between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, and it was resolved primarily through the use of drones provided to the Azerbaijani military from Turkey. Two questions about that. A, what does that say about the growing influence of Turkey uh, in the region? And B, what does the success of their drones in taking out tanks and artillery pieces and pillboxes say about traditional military strategy that involves armor and involves uh, artillery uh, that now have been proven to be ex exceptionally vulnerable to drone attack? Drones now directly compete with manned aircraft in providing direct support in military operations. And they're more expendable, uh, they're cheaper in the process. And Russia is steadily demonstrating uh, their utility, but so is Turkey. 
I could spend the rest of the time we've got in talking about the authoritarian regime in Turkey. Erdogan has steadily accrued powers. He envisions that he can follow the path of Putin and Xi, stay in power as long as he wants, but to be a major factor in all of the countries around his region. Uh, he, in fact, played a big role in propping up the government in Tripoli against the revolt from the other side, uh, which was being supported by Egypt and the UAE and by Russian mercenaries. Um, he was the key factor in keeping Assad in power in Syria. And he clearly, uh, I'm sorry, Russia was, but Turkey was the prime constraint in their being able to take over all of uh, Syria in the process. Um, I worry about where Erdogan will take them next. And uh, he clearly is looking to expand his influence in the entire region by use of his military capabilities, but by use of things like drones rather than heavy uh, use of manpower. Yeah, what we see with drones is that if a drone is destroyed, you don't have uh, bodies coming back uh, and yep. therefore you don't have the concern. And my fear, uh, not fear, the reality is we are moving to a place where unmanned vehicles are gonna be the, the face of warfare. Uh, in the next 10 to 15 years. There's just no question in my mind. Stay and we're in seeing that we're seeing that move, John, not just in drones. Uh, the act of now to do unmanned small ships. Wow. Uh, unmanned submersibles at all. So a number of countries are looking at how you can expand your potential military capabilities without putting people at risk. So let's just let's stay on that subject then. If we get to the point where we have unmanned assets that are expendable because humans are not in it, doesn't that encourage their use by their owners? I'm afraid it does. Then add artificial intelligence on top of it and the <laughs> ability to automatically trigger all these activities to go without human intervention. May be very productive, very efficient, but it certainly uh, goes awry from my point of view in making sure you've got solid civilian control of military activity. We are we are approaching a, a very, very concerning strategic inflection point uh, for the human race. Uh, a lot of things are going on. Most people are worried about climate change, but you and I are more worried about what we just finished talking about. Let's talk about a couple other things because our time is starting to get short. Iran and Israel, are obviously big players in the Middle East, but the Saudis have just proposed two things that should be concerning to all Americans. One, to end the civil war uh, in Yemen, but more importantly, to reposition themselves as a major supplier of oil to China. What should we think about that? Well, they've been the major supplier of oil to China now for a couple of years uh, in the process. They are, uh, the uh, Saudi's largest customer in this process. But, Saudi, but recently, China's reached out to Iran to start buying a lot more oil from Iran, which will probably come out of what they're buying, reduce what they're buying from Saudi Arabia. Uh, you've probably seen the Houthis have already turned down the Saudi Arabia call for a ceasefire in Yemen. You're not going to get the Houthis to agree unless Iran tells them to agree. Okay. And Iran sustains them to keep pressure on Saudi Arabia. Where does that leave Israel? There's yet another, another, another election in Israel. Uh, I'm hearing that maybe Netanyahu will be actually stronger this time. But how does Israel play in this ballpark, given what's going on between Iran and Saudi and the increased Russian and Turkish and, and Chinese involvement in the region? And, and the appearance that we're pulling back. In the years when I used to interact with Israel regularly, frequently, sometimes daily, uh, I dealt with either Labor Party or the Likud Party. And then this Labor Party sort of blew up and 
additional um, parties were created to the right of Likud. What you now have is a situation, this is the fourth election. Netanyahu, with the votes not totally finished, but Netanyahu may have uh, votes to lead, but he's still got to have agreement from parties on the right to yep. put together a government. So we may be facing yet a fifth election out of all this. Now, so that distracts from Israel's ability to play a larger role. The great story on the other side is the advances in Israel driven by capturing and using technology, growing businesses, becoming a major factor. Uh, the Israeli economy has boomed now for 20 years. A lot of that from talent that first came together as they were drafted as 18 year olds yep. and were put together uh, in uh, the most sophisticated areas, they went out and started businesses when they got through. So that's why Israel is now attractive to the Persian Gulf because of what they offer in the way of economic interchange and opportunity to help grow businesses, not rely for economies that to this point have been almost totally reliant on oil. Yep. And all of those countries recognize they need to reduce their independence. In Saudi Arabia, I don't expect anything uh, substantial to happen until King Sultan, uh, Sultan passes from the scene. His health is not good. The issue, will there be a successful succession by MBS or will the other royals come together to block that? So we may be in for a significant period of instability. Uh, if uh, MBS does proceed, we already know he's going to be a pretty cold-hearted, direct uh, manager, or what's the word I'm looking for, uh, autocrat in yep. the process. But uh, the real challenges he's got in opening up that country is will the younger generation, who've always been subsidized, will they be willing to work? as opposed to relying on expatriates to yep. keep their economy going. Let's give our audience some whiplash because we're short on time. Let's go to Cuba for a second. Uh, uh, any hope that Cuba is gonna get its act together? Or are we gonna continue to have to maintain a quasi uh, quarantine on Cuba, blockade on Cuba? There are fewer internal uh, opportunities to affect change inside Cuba than could be there if we had facilitated investment in Cuba. Uh, the embargo ceased to be useful when the Soviet Union fell apart. And that's the point at which we should have encouraged investment to flow into Cuba. So there were other influences. Yeah. Chances Bill, that doesn't exist. So um, simply building barriers isn't going to produce the change inside Cuba that we need to see, that the Cuban people need to see. Okay. Final question. Quote, I'm from Singapore and see so much potential in Southeast Asia over the next two decades. The economies of Indonesia, Vietnam, Myanmar could be the next Asian tigers. But can you comment on the Myanmar situation? Is this a point of no return for that country? And I will add on. What role is China playing in what's going on in Myanmar, better known as Burma? China probably has more opportunity to influence the military in Myanmar than anybody else uh, to tell them they're on the wrong path. Uh, I'm surprised at the scale of resistance inside Myanmar this time. Uh, the economy has come to a halt. The government's pretty much come to a halt. They're arresting a lot of demonstrators, but people are refusing to go to the office to their jobs to work. And so the challenge for the military leaders who staged the coup are growing larger every day. We need a unified external approach to put all the economic pressure we can on the military to tell them they need to go back to the barracks and get out of running the country. 
but you know, they so many of them got to be very prosperous in the decades that the military ran the country. And they were being deprived of that. And the current government, they're eager to get their hands back on the till and take, you know, get their own personal wealth back. It's a sad situation. I don't see any near-term quick fix. Yeah. Two more quick questions. I know you have a hard stop at 1250, correct? That's fine. All right. So we're gonna make we're gonna honor that. Can Europe ever get its act together or is it gonna become a gigantic Disneyland where people go for vacations? Because they can't even get their vaccines distributed and they're fighting against each other. Biggest issue is who's gonna be leading Germany. Mrs. Merkel will leave office in September. Not clear what an election is going to produce, what kind of coalition government will have to take her place. But the lack of her leadership, we've seen for 16 years, creates a significant void inside Europe. Mr. Macron has his own challenges. He's a little more than halfway through his five year term. Um, he's got lots of opposition but he remains probably the best hope for change. Uh, the fact that Drahu, who ran European Central Bank was willing to be drafted to take over the tough job of leading uh, Italy during a very tough time is a slight glimmer of hope in the process. Re-election of the conservative leadership in Netherlands for a fourth term, those are all positive signs. But the European Commission, the European bureaucracy continues to stumble and make mistakes. And that's not helpful for the long term getting Europe to move. And the mishandling of the whole COVID and vaccination problem has compounded their problems. Let's go to India, Pakistan, and China as the last question. We know there have been real challenges uh, trying to figure out what's going to resolve the, the issues in Kashmir, but there are also now challenges between China and India with the big uh, border blow up a, a few months ago. How do you see that playing out? First, um, there is some withdrawal of forces by both China and India from being in direct contact. So lowering the possibility of follow on clashes there. Um, Modi's decision to join President Biden's first interaction with other countries wasn't NATO, wasn't combined Mexico and Canada. It was the Quad, India, Australia, Japan, and the US. That sent lots of signals in the process. Yet to see how that plays out. Secretary of Defense Austin going there for a visit, but probably the biggest news was the offer yesterday, letter from Modi to the Prime Minister of Pakistan, wanting to improve relations and reduce clashes. That gesture from Modi was a substantial surprise. The issue is, will the Pakistanis react to it positively? Will they trust it? Could we see a reduction of tension between Pakistan and India that would be a huge plus for South Asia if it were to occur. I frankly was surprised to see Modi reach out. And it's an expression of his self-confidence at this point in where he is in governing India. Yeah, he's very confident about his power in India. I think Modi also may look at how the Belt and Road Initiative investments that China has made in Pakistan are starting to unwind because Pakistan can't service the debt and the Chinese are saying, well, you know, if you can't service the debt, give us a port. We'll, we'll run it for 99 years. I know that's not popular with the Pakistanis. Admiral, Bob, it's so good to spend time with you again. This has been a, a very fast paced conversation and your insight on what's going on everywhere continues to be amazing. Mm -hmm.